cannot tell you how many people have told me that marijuana saved their lives. Veterans, people that had cancer, people whose children are epileptic or autistic. It's mind boggling that this medicine doesn't get its due from particularly the, the medical community. They don't teach this in medical school. They don't talk, tell them about cannabis. They tell them it's harmful. The AMA is not on board with cannabis. And it's the nurses. That's who you hear from. The nurses who actually deal with the patients that are the ones that are telling them, you didn't hear this from me, but have your kids find you some cannabis, some marijuana, and smoke it because that will help you through this. I am a nurse. Okay, so what they're doing in, in traditional medicine is kind of butchering, just like when we're, I'm you know, working with a cancer patient. They're gonna slash it, burn it, and poison. <laughs> so that's basically what they do to us, but, but they don't fix us, right? So the body is altered at, at, at a moment in time, and then it stays altered because the traditional medicine doesn't resolve things. My husband, Jeff Jones, was one of the first to try to provide medical cannabis to the necessity patients back in the 90s. We're talking those that were really dying of AIDS and cancer. And he wound up working with the city of Oakland to dispense that cannabis on Broadway. And this is before California passed the law. And so he wound up in quite the court battle over the next decade, 12 years. He went through all the way to the Supreme Court on this issue. He was the first and he lost <laughs> badly. Uh, in fact, he was told, you, Jeff Jones, can never do this again. And so he turned over the legacy of what he had started to a man named Richard Lee, who had started as Jeff's grower. And then he became licensed in the city to dispense medical cannabis. But that wasn't enough for Mr. Lee. He wanted to do more. And so he started more businesses. He felt the best way to revitalize Oakland was to fill the empty space. And so he started the university because folks kept calling him, asking him to teach them how to grow cannabis. And so he said, look, I'll make you a deal. I'll teach you how to grow, but you need to go to city council with me and try to get the law changed. And he quickly realized if he was going to get a bunch of ragtag growers to show up to city hall, he'd better teach them what to talk about and how to present. And so Oaksterdam University was born. I had a very dear friend who died of cancer and also smoked cannabis and was very active in helping to bring 216 to the light and to help pass it, albeit she died during that period. And then to have that grow into an industry in California that was very compassionate, really did support medical patients and also offered many other patients or people who have other needs for cannabis an opportunity to feel comfortable and to access their cannabis without having to go to a dealer and making a phone call and like making some, saying some weird words and saying, you know, uh, maybe uh, can I swing by at 12 o'clock, you know? It's like very odd, very uncomfortable using code language. At this point in time in my life, I am feeling so relieved and so thankful that I can actually say, I want to buy some cannabis and go to a legal store and purchase something that can potentially taste very good and also I can trust. Ultimately, what ended the alcohol prohibition was largely led by women agreeing on this one thing, that prohibition has failed and it is bad. It is bad for our family and it is bad for our community. And so we must end it. We don't have to agree on anything else right now. Just that one thing, deschedule. Most people that are in my community know about cannabis because we've gone to jail for it. Unfortunately, my sibling served some time because of it. But we will, within the church, allow everyone to take diabetic medicine, to take medicine for cancer, all of this that's prescribed by a doctor. But when it comes to cannabis, it's like, no, 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 no. Cannabis is actually a healer. It's not just to get high. And while that is part of it, and that's okay, I, in my journey, getting better acquainted with it, am learning more from the healing and wellness perspective. I was raised around cannabis. I was not necessarily a user. In 2009, my grandmother had come down with pancreatic cancer. She was given three months to live. We sought out medical cannabis and she lived an additional seven months. So it really inspired me to want to help other individuals while I was attending college. 
I actually stopped going to school because I was growing throughout this industry and I saw where it was headed and I'm very passionate about helping patients and getting them the best life that they can get through marijuana. Modern day, we have tools now like our phones where we can share observational trial data or just anecdotal information around millions of people. And I would take anecdotal information from a million people over a thousand people in a clinical trial. And that's where I think we need to go is utilizing the technologies we have, the peer-to-peer -to -peer tools we have to share this type of information so that the confidence is built inside into the physicians that, look, this works for pain. There's a million people over here that claim it works for pain. And whether you believe them or not doesn't matter, they're gonna use it. If you decide to put your head in the sand over this, they're going to find a new physician and you'll be gone. So what the FDA says about it, and that has to go through their, their religious regimen of doing this particular trial structure, when they're blind to the fact that the ECS is actually involved in that structure, um, that's going to, I think, drag on for way too long. And thankfully, the legalization is going to bypass some of that. This was my first year at CanMed, and it was an absolute pleasure. I think the coolest thing I got to hear about was some of the Israeli scientists, you know, looking at how different cannabinoids affect cancer cells. And so they were looking at breast cancer, colon cancer, many types. And what they were finding, and this is taking a lot of years to, to figure this out and get the data to support it, is that it's not just one cannabinoid that is doing the most significant work of getting rid of these cancer cells. It's the combination. So, you know, what we've been claiming, you know, the entourage effect is actually showing up to be true with heart data. And so they're seeing that it's not just one cannabinoid, it's the combination of two, or even the combination of two plus a terpene that is really having the greatest effect. And then on top of that, the different types of cancer cells, it's not the same with each type. So whereas, you know, combination of three might work for pancreatic cancer, it's not going to work for breast cancer. So there's just so many combinations and variables that we're going to have to figure out to, to really get this right. But, you know, we're, we're well on the way of figuring it out. We don't have an understanding of where these compounds all completely play, but the concept of using a single one as being the rifle shot that's going to solve your complex disease is, doesn't, isn't really supported by what we're seeing here at CanMed. There's crazy medicine and great research all around the world already available, but everybody needs to do their own due diligence, just like when they go to the doctor and they get a prescription. Just because the directions say this, that's bullshit. Everybody is different. You go through the list of epilepsy and potentially autism and fibromyalgia, you suddenly realize we have been missing the entire Rosetta Stone for medicine for 80 years, and it's now here. For someone with my condition, brain cancer, the doctors have all given a green light knowing that I'm taking it. The people I've met and the education process has been incredible. There's a lot of older patients that can really use the benefits of cannabis. And I think the thing that I walk away with is the power of how we need to educate people. I mean, you've seen some of the specials done about CBD. You've seen some of the science collected on THC. The fact that it had anti-cancer properties alone should twist the fate about what we're talking about. Because if this was parsley and it was on the side of our dinner plate, and it came out that it was doing what it was doing in our community, it would be the next wonder drug. But because it's the little five to leaf marijuana, we have a problem with it. <clears throat> well, now we don't have a problem with it anymore. It's fine. Congress doesn't lead, Congress follows. And so it's really up to us citizens. And it's important to realize how much your voice is amplified because so few people are involved in the political process that you and 10 of your friends you and 10 of your friends can make a politician feel like there are tens of thousands of people that feel the same way that you do. If only you call, if only you write, if only you make your voice heard. And especially in the current day and age where the books are cooked and the facts are false and the news is fake, your story, your story is what's most important and what will resonate with other human beings of why this is so important for you to change.